attitude. We are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Seamus and not sure this is a great idea. Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As uh, usual, I'm joined by my co-host Conrad. Hello. And in this episode, we are joined by David Tobe from uh, the think tank Quilliam, uh, the head of social policy at Quilliam. Uh, Welcome to the podcast, David. Hi, guys. Uh, First of all, I'd like to ask for those of our listeners that uh, might not be familiar with Quilliam, uh, what is it that you do at the think tank? Right. Well, Quilliam is the world's first counter extremism think tank. Uh, it was founded by people who, by and large, and there are some exceptions to this, but by and large came out of uh, militant, uh, what people often describe as extremist Islamist mm. organisations, principally uh, Hizbut Tahir. Uh, and about a decade ago, there was a great movement out of Hizbut Tahir. Hizbut Tahir is an interesting organisation because it recruits really, or certainly was recruiting at the time, very much the brightest and the best. Mm. And these were people who are hugely uh, charismatic, very intelligent, incredibly hardworking, mm. um, and also uh, independent thinkers. And the problem with recruiting a bunch of uh, independent thinkers to an extremist organization is that at some point some of them are going to say hang on a second guys this isn't right um, mm. and that's what happened to a generation of people who were in his foot to here so they came out uh, founded uh, Quilliam which uh, exists not just to focus on Islamist extremism but on extremism of all types and by extremism we really mean uh, a political activity, a way of looking at the world, Mm. which is inimicable to the fundamental precepts of liberal democracy, by which we all naturally think of equality between persons, fundamental human rights, the primacy of democracy, and so on. Um, So there seems to have been sort of like less Islamist sort of extremism in the news recently. Obviously, you had ISIS seemed to have gone quiet for now hopefully that's a permanent thing and that's not just temporary but um what do you think the reasons for this are well i I, I, it's worth remembering that that in terms of uh i mean it's always very difficult to 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 think about uh which areas of extremism uh are are the worst and to come to a sort of firm conclusion about that because uh you, you may well have small pockets of very, very intense and dangerous uh, radical and violent uh, extremist politics in some parts of the political spectrum, uh, but a softer and more widespread uh, uh, iteration of it in others. Um, It it also really sort of turns on where attacks have taken place. And uh, because we are living in a global uh, news economy, uh, attacks that happen anywhere in the world, uh, if they are eye-catching and if they are unusual, dominate the headlines. Um, I mean, we have seen a, a, a range of uh, attacks coming from a, a broad variety of, of sources, um, and we've seen both uh, attacks by uh, Islamist groups and attacks by anti-Muslim bigots and haters and uh, white supremacists, uh, neo-Nazis, um, who have attacked both Jewish and uh, Muslim targets. So, you know, it, it, these things are, are, are very much dependent, I think, on, on, on what's happened in the last few months. People's memories are very short and uh, one atrocity tends to block out another in the public imagination. But, I mean, so, you know, in terms of, of uh, the actual creation of a state uh, where the sort of uh, attacks which would make the news if they were one-off, by a neo-Nazi group that in Syria and Iraq formed the basis of an entire state and every day uh, attacks of that that, that nature were being committed against a defenceless and innocent population. Uh, A couple of episodes ago, I was speaking to uh, Dan Murdoch, who is a filmmaker who's made uh, lots of documentaries about uh, extremist groups, uh, particularly in America. And he said that he'd noticed from... 2015, when he made uh, a documentary about the, the KKK, the sort of now, that the methods uh, through which extremism are presented have changed, and a, a lot more of it is happening online. Do you think that the best way 
to tackle extremism now is perhaps not necessarily on the ground, but through uh, the Internet, through websites, through social media? Possibly, yes. Um, I mean, the, the, the best way of fighting political uh, extremism of any sort is to create a culture which is firmly anti-extremist in nature. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a limit to what a government can do. There's a limit to what a education process in schools or, uh, you know, through the Internet can do. Uh, the, the only thing that really can uh, can effectively combat extremism is having a uh, a, a culture which resists it where and wherever it uh, arises. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that uh, often happens to people when they're drawn into their own sort of closed bubble extremist subculture is that they get cut off from other people. They don't hear countervailing uh, arguments. People don't check them and say, mm. are you sure about that? And mm. uh, have you had a chance to look at some other ways of uh, considering the particular issue you're you're thinking about um uh, so uh, one of the most notable uh, recurring features of terrorist plots in britain that have been uh, successfully thwarted have been that uh, family members and acquaintances have uh, uh, go gone to authorities and said something quite serious is going on we don't really know how many other uh, cases there have been where people have been sort of drawn back from the brink by somebody who said, look, you know, I can see you're very angry and upset about something, but uh, I, you may be looking at this the wrong way. And those are successes which we'll never hear about because they never ended up uh, creating horrific headline grabbing atrocities. So um, back in 2013, um, Quilliam did some work and managed to sort of get Tommy Robinson to quit the EDL. But since then, obviously, he's still risen once again to be a major figure in sort of the right far right in the uk um what do you think sort of the mistakes were made there that sort of led to him sort of returning to that fold well my personal view on on that man is that he's a grifter uh he's essentially a person who has look, look at it from his point of view uh, you become in a sort of four or five year period the most notorious uh, 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 sort of uh, stir in in mm. Britain. You uh, are at the head of uh, marches which march past people's places of worship, causing uh, uh, fear and apprehension. Uh, and then suddenly uh, you have an opportunity uh, to get out. Um, what do you do after then? And uh, he's a man who really has very little going for him in his life uh, other than the most successful thing that he's ever done, which is to be the head of a, uh, a, a Muslim baiting organization. And uh, uh, really, I think after a, a short period of time, he was a man who found himself with no real visible uh, means of support, you know, how do you go, how, you know, how do you go back to normal life after doing mm. that sort of thing? And it's a question really that applies not just to people like Tommy Robinson, but to people who come out of any form of extremist subculture, uh, or particularly where you've been very successful, uh, in it. Uh, there needs to be something else that people can do. Um, and for most people, uh, that's going to involve going back to ordinary life, uh, you mm. know, getting a qualification, getting a job, uh, uh, you know, fading uh, into anonymity and obscurity. But if you're a person who sees that there's an opportunity to uh, continue making uh, a, a living to have your uh, vanity flattered, um, the lure of uh, going back into what you've uh, been most successful at doing um, is going to be uh, irresistible. And I, I think if you look at the, the, the sort of trajectory that Tommy Robinson uh, uh, took after uh, the uh, attempt by Quilliam to wean him away from the sort of uh, agitation that he was involved in, um, uh, he was picked up by uh, effectively a, a Canadian um, alternative media conglomerate. He realised that there was a lot of money to be made uh, doing that. He went off and uh, founded his own uh, similar operation where all of the the profits were coming to him, and he's done extremely well out of that. Um, and then 
uh, extremely dispiritingly uh, aspects of the uh, American, what might all, almost have said before their dalliance with Tommy Robinson, um, mainstream uh, right uh, took him on as a cause. And one of the most depressing things of the last couple of years was seeing the Middle East Forum, which had been, you know, in many ways a sort of respectable uh, uh, organization, uh, uh, putting out um, a message to their uh, supporters that Tommy Robinson was a brave fighter for freedom and liberty whose life was in danger. Uh, now, look, you know, Quidium is a very small organization. Um, it, it doesn't have uh, that sort of money. Uh, it wasn't offering to Tommy Robinson an opportunity to do anything which was even vaguely on the, uh, the level uh, of the sort of opportunities he's had uh, uh, on the uh, the US and the self-generated style uh, side of things. And um, uh, the, I think, you know, if, from a purely commercial point of view, he made a uh, made a prudent decision, but not one which really um, not one which really uh, has done the country any good. Um, you spoke about the uh, the right in America, that element of the right in America, embracing Tommy Robinson. How much do you think that the mainstream of political parties, whether they be right or left, are to blame for uh, a more extreme tone in our political debate because they are willing to accept and support figures who are on uh, the extreme of both politics and society? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's not a UK or a US phenomenon only. It's a global phenomenon. Uh, we've mm -hmm. seen the collapse of the social democratic liberal centre. Uh, mm -hmm. We've uh, in, in a range of countries, France uh, uh, was almost uh, the most notable victim where had it not been for Macron, mm -hmm. there would have been a, a, a direct polarisation between the choice of the far left or the far right. Um, and it is, I mean, I mean, this is one of the, the, the my recurring themes. Uh, I, I think we spend too much time talking about combating extremism. I mean, when we say extremism, what do we really mean? And what we mean mm. is uh, a, a politics that that opposes uh, the liberal democratic values we've talked about. I, I've always thought that instead of talking about being anti-extremists, it's better to be talking about the virtues of liberal social democracy of pluralist uh, societies uh, and it's by having that sort of strong politics that we have the strongest bulwark against extremism but uh, you know uh, horror and sensation uh, tends to uh, capture the agenda of uh, even the most mature democracies from time to time and we're going through that period at the moment uh, my my sincere and profound hope is that um, within the next decade, uh, we will have developed resilience as a culture to that sort of polarised, conspiracist, uh, hate-driven, sensation-seeking uh, worldview. Uh, I mean, we, the, the problem is, I, I, I think that we face is that people have seen pluralist liberal democracy as a kind of default position. It's mm. as natural as the air or the water. You know, it just is there. You don't have to strive to create it you don't have to defend it and one of the things that we've learned in this country and uh, in a number of other countries is that that is not in fact the default position if you don't if you don't work hard to uh, support it if you don't uh, uh, oppose threats to it uh, it will collapse and that i'm afraid is something that we've seen happening uh, in a more than one country um, so is it your view then that the, there is sort of been a rise in extremism in the UK recently in politics? Because from the way I've, I've sort of seen it, I mean, I think that if anything, if you think about sort of 10 years ago when you had Nick Griffin on Question Time, you know, an open racist person who was an MEP, elected, and there's two BMP MEPs actually. Whereas now, like the Brexit party, though it's sort of, you know, it, it's sort of although it might be more sort of right wing than most people, it's still it's not in the same vein as what we've seen in the past. So, I, I, I mean, could you not say that there's been less extremism in politics? 
It's an interesting question. Um, uh, I mean, I, we certainly had a, a very, very clear bogeyman in the BNP. One of the, I mean, one of the interesting things about uh, the BNP is that that you'd see polling uh, for the policies of the BNP, and they would often have widespread uh, support within uh, uh, the country at large. Um, what put people off uh, the BNP? was that they were very, very obviously a Nazi party and that everything that they did to try to rebrand as many European fascist parties did uh, were unsuccessful at uh, uh, persuading the public that that um, they were uh, uh, not to be touched with a barge pole. So, you know, you would have the polling which would say, do you agree with these policies? And you go through a list of things that the BNP said that they were in favour of. And then you would finally ask uh, the, the polling subject, uh, the BNP has these as uh, its policies, would you vote for them? And an overwhelming majority of people uh, would uh, absolutely uh, uh, reject them out of hand because they knew what the BNP was. Now, uh, I don't regard the Brexit Party or UKIP as a neo-fascist party in disguise because they're clearly not, but they're certainly a party who have managed to latch on to a number of uh, of populist um, uh, themes uh, uh, which uh, focus on... uh, uh, Things that we often associate with extreme politics, including uh, a, a sense that there is a conspiracy against the general population uh, by elites. At the same time, we've also seen genuinely new uh, uh, political movements, which uh, are have, have are closer to to fascist and neo Nazi parties, but also come from a a, a, a different uh, tradition. And I'm thinking here of uh, of identitarian movements, groups like Generation Identity, where there you know there may be a membership which uh, uh, includes people who have had their uh, uh, yeah their, their political training, so to speak, in uh, in uh, uh, traditional parties of the far right, but who are focusing less on a, uh, a racial analysis of, of politics and more on a, a cultural analysis. And that, to some degree, has uh, allowed them in some countries, not in the United Kingdom, but in, in France, for example, uh, to uh, make uh, greater inroads because they, they do look dissimilar, particularly in the way that they present themselves. And these groups often talk about optics um, uh, as something very different from what had come before and not simply a attempt to uh, rebrand old style uh, n- n- Nazi nostalgia politics, which very much characterised the, uh, the far right of the 70s and 80s and to a lesser extent the 90s. Uh, now, you mentioned uh, the transformative uh, nature of uh, far right parties in an attempt to uh, rebrand themselves. Uh, in the Labour Party, we've seen uh, a lot of people who uh, would have perhaps briefly in the history of the Labour Party been seen as on the extreme of uh, the party now being involved in uh, the very heart of it uh, and a lot of people have um, uh, done this via, you know, the yeah, the, the, the cloak of uh, new politics, new better politics uh, under Corbyn. How uh, important do you think it is to point out within mainstream parties, whether they be uh, the Labour Party with anti-Semitism and people in the past who have uh, held um, views that are perhaps not uh, akin to the mainstream of the Labour Party, we're now in charge of it. And in the Conservatives, you can say similar things. Uh, how important do you think it is to point out that though both parties might say uh, this is normal, that it isn't actually normal, the, the, the language that they might be using or the uh, people that they are supporting and are allowing into their ranks? I think political parties have failed to realise the extent to which uh, the views and attitudes held by significant and often organised parts of their uh, base have changed. Um, uh, the change within the Labour Party is a uh, is a very stark and uh, good illustrative example of that, in that um, Absolutely everything that you see in Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party now was evidently part and a strong and a growing part. We might even say a part with momentum of left (laughs) politics for uh, over a decade before the takeover of the the Labour Party by that faction uh, happened. So, you know, if if you look at what 
brought uh, Jeremy Corbyn to power. It wasn't a sudden sort of, you know, groundswell of people who had previously had no interest in politics and had not been politically involved at all. Uh, the momentum movement was able to draw on a ecosystem of uh, political organisations and campaigns, many of them quite cranky, uh, which had uh, been strong and uh, active for a very long time. And I'm thinking about uh, the the people who came out of movements as diverse as uh, um, some of the the wackier ends of environmentalism, uh, the Venezuela, the uh, Putin, uh, the uh, Iranian, uh, the Palestinian foreign policy uh, mm. based campaigns, uh, and then other sort of more inchoate campaigns that had been, uh, uh, you know, been had burnt very brightly before burning out, um, uh, like Occupy, uh, which were treated as as a sort of bright new dawn in uh, British politics. The Guardian would run. Uh, uh, occupy features for weeks at a time uh, until these effectively became a mainstream uh, identifying part of what it meant to be a a left-wing person and they would be uh, they would overlap so you know if you went to a venezuela solidarity meeting you'd probably get invited to uh, to go to a cuba solidarity meeting Mm -hmm. and that's that would gradually become your political and your social uh, uh, group and a bubble of activism would be created which a group like Momentum was simply able to draw upon and uh, pull together. Uh, so these things don't just come out of thin air. I mean, they they have a cultural and organisational precedent that uh, uh, all that's really required is for them to be uh, uh, deployed and turned to a particular political object for them to be potentially successful. Now, I don't see that um, in quite that way happening uh, on the uh, the right of the political spectrum, but I think there's certainly mm. a, a potential for it to do so. I mean, we are looking at the moment at a uh, a, a Brexit party, which is effectively a, a Farage uh, fan club, um, which uh, is able to get sort of between 10 and 25 percent uh, of the population uh, uh, supporting it. Uh, what that doesn't have or doesn't have in quite the same way that the variety of left groups that I talked about uh, a moment ago, uh, what they don't have is uh, the mailing lists, the uh, the meetings, the people who are um, experienced in activism, who can be drawn on and sort of turned into a, a political uh, machine. But uh, I, I wouldn't sort of discount the possibility that, that at some point they might well become uh, uh, so. And uh, to, to answer your question, um, the leadership of political parties often think that what matters is making the argument in the country as a whole, uh, mm. is what happens within the political party as it, as it exists at a particular moment. The policies that that political party are going to promote and uh, they hope enact when in, in power. And you can be very focused on that and particularly on the party and the Westminster side of thing, things. But by doing that, you miss what's happening within the broader political culture of your part of the political spectrum. And one of the things that was really, really noticeable about the uh, the lead up uh, to the first sort of great rebellion against Jeremy Corbyn within the Labour Party was that for a year or two, two people weren't even capable of describing what it was that was wrong with Jeremy Corbyn's politics. Mm. I mean, almost the only thing you'd ever hear from people was um, it's unpopular. We're going to lose an election. Um, uh, you know, th- this isn't going to uh, win over floating voters. Um, uh, there was almost no ability, no language to express what was uh, intellectually and politically wrong with the sort of politics that was being promoted. So uh, the short answer to your question is uh, political parties need to be far cannier about threats which uh, uh, they face from within their own political tradition. And uh, hopefully uh, in future political parties will be less cavalier as dismissing them as the noisy and the unimportant fringe which mm. is very much what people would say when you'd say, look at what's happening within the Labour Party. It would simply be dismissed as uh, a, a, a trivial and unimportant. That's not what the Labour Party is really about. The Labour Party is really about building schools. It's about family credit. Mm. And those sort of things absolutely were 
the sort of things that that ordinary voters cared about. Mm. Uh, but it wasn't the sort of thing which motivated the activists who were prepared to give up their weekends, their evenings and indeed their lives to uh, making a pol- particular political vision a reality. I uh, I wonder how much do you think that the way that the media uh, presents extremism, whether it be in news reports or in um, fiction, in films or TV series, influences the way that we perceive extremism? That's not something I've ever really thought about before. Um I mean, anybody who is anybody who works in a job uh, and then sees a representation of uh, of that job or, uh, you know, what it is what you, you do from day to day um, uh, in any form of fiction, particularly television series, is horrified by the inaccuracies. You know, um, they that you know, it, I, 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 my background is as a lawyer and I would. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, uh, well, there was a time when I used to watch legal dramas and I've just given up doing it because <laughs> uh, the sort of things that happen in series about lawyers, by and large, would never, ever happen in real life. Like, you know, like most things, real life is much more boring than uh, than the, uh, the the way in which they're presented in 45 minute uh, uh, episodes of drama series. But at the same time, uh, there is and always has been a kind of feedback between the uh, way in which a job is uh, represented on television and the way that the people who perform that job uh, come to think of themselves. Um, And so a a very good example of it is during the 1970s, um, uh, when uh, Starsky and Hutch, uh, Mm. the American cop series, was a uh, a staple of your your British weekend uh, viewing, Mm. um, police cars' doors used to, it started to fall off. And the reason for that was that uh, whenever Starsky and Hutch jumped out of uh, a, a car, they would slam the door as hard as, hard as they could. In reality, a car door can only take that a few times yeah. before it starts sort of showing a little bit of metal stress. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think people, there, there, there has been a degree of glamorization of both uh, extremism and the job of extremism uh, uh, hunting. But I think for most people who are uh, who are actually sort of involved in the cold face work, uh, it's much more boring and less uh, uh, exciting than it appears in television series. And the same thing must must apply to um, uh, people who uh, are involved in uh, extremist organisations. Four Lions mm. is a great example of this because yeah. Four Lions is a, is a film that I know is absolutely loved by all of the people who are on the Salafi jihadi fringe and everybody who's involved in counter extremism because mm. it's uh, it's the one film that uh, really captures the silliness and the absurdity and the incompetence um, mm, yeah. as well as you know the terrible outcome. Uh, don't want to have any spoilers for people oh, who haven't no. seen no, it, no. Yet. <laughs> uh, but but of people going going down that route. But it really gets the extent to which. Um, so many people who are involved in this sort of uh, thing are essentially silly and uh, if it hadn't been for what they were doing they'd be non-entities you mentioned earlier on about um sort of environmental groups do you think sort of the tactics of things like extinction rebellion are sort of conversion to extremism especially in the sort of future with more and more sort of climate change being in the news and people think seeing it as such a big thing yeah, well, I mean, there is something, I mean, there's been a focus, I think, uh, on the uh, non-violent law-breaking tactics of Extinction Rebellion. And uh, I, I don't personally engage in, and I'm not an advocate of non-violent uh, uh, law-breaking, but I don't regard mm. that as uh, an inherently uh, extremist path to go down. Um there has been environmental activism uh, in the past, which has involved uh, a, a degree of, of violent extremism. Um, but uh, uh, what Extinction Rebellion is doing at the moment uh, and what it, the only things it's ever talked about uh, doing um, don't um, uh, uh, strike me as, as imminently likely to go down that line. What I do find uh, worrying about Extinction Rebellion is uh, that um, they present uh, either 
honestly because they believe it or cynically because they think it is motivating a uh a, a, essentially an end times vision of the nature of the environmental challenge that we face and i've uh it, it's quite difficult to pin down exactly what extinction rebellion think um from their literature and they spend a lot of time saying you know we'd like to have citizens juries to actually investigate these uh these issues but if you look at their rhetoric um, the very name Extinction Rebellion uh, is premised upon something which they'll often say in meetings, which is we are, are a few years ago, uh, 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 we are a few years away from human extinction. Mm. Uh, now, if, if you look at uh, the best of the peer reviewed uh, environmental studies and the studies of studies, uh, what they indicate is a very serious hit to human well-being uh, that will be uh, occasioned by uh, environmental change if it is not addressed. But no, those studies, by and large, do not suggest that human extinction is on the cards. And that there is, I think, something worrying about effectively telling people very simplistically, perhaps just in order to motivate them, uh, what you're doing at the moment is going to save the whole of the human race from going down the tube. Um, that is, a, I, I think, a, a, a grossly irresponsible way of uh, conducting politics, um, installing in people not, not simply a sense that there is a need to do something urgently, but that if you don't, the world will come to an end, uh, is something that potentially does lead on to uh, a, a, a greater challenge uh, uh, of extremism. And uh, I have been to Extinction Rebellion meetings where that has been said um, and in which it's been made very clear that unless uh, the things that the Extinction Rebellion uh, uh, group think need to be done, uh, uh, then we will be facing curtains for the human race. And that mm. just isn't true. But then they go on and say, uh, it, and you will be arrested. And if you go to prison, prison won't be so bad. I went to a meeting in which a, a, a person who had been to prison a number of times in, uh, over the past couple of decades talked about his life in prison. And he basically said, it's like a holiday camp and here's your room. And, you know, the, this is uh, what you'll be able to do. And it really won't be so bad. Um, the, the reason that they, they want people to be uh, imprisoned, incidentally, is because there is a social change theory which suggests that uh, if a certain percentage of the population is prepared to get itself arrested, um, then at that point, um, support for the people who've been arrested uh, uh, is so great that uh, the demands of the uh, the group uh, become irresistible. And I can understand, you know, why you go down that route, but I think it's uh, it, it, it is one that I favour considerably less than simply making the case honestly, proposing workable, practical solutions, and then encouraging people to support that through the ordinary democratic process. That can be done and it should be done, but it's not the way that Extinction Rebellion seems to me to be set up to operate. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the podcast now. Uh, thank you for uh, being on, David. Uh, my pleasure. I'd like to ask you uh, one final question. Now, we've seen... Um, dancing quite a bit in politics in the last few years with uh, Theresa May's premiership. And today, more uh, celebrities have been announced to participate in the current series of Strictly Come Dancing. We, we really are talking about da no, not metaphorical <laughs> dancing, but actually dancing. <laughs> they are actually dancing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if you were um, ever offered the opportunity to participate in Strictly Come Dancing or any other uh, <laughs> reality television programme, uh, would you do it? Uh, I would certainly not do anything involved <laughs> in dancing. I can tell you, um, I, I, I loved my wedding day. I got married mm. uh, uh, almost two decades ago and um, it really was the happiest day of my life. But all the way through my wedding, I was dreading the moment where I'd have to do the first dance because dancing is something I do incredibly badly i'm much better in the studio with a microphone in front of me well thank you for being on the podcast david um uh, we look forward to having you on again at some point lovely to talk to you uh well you can uh, if you wish to uh, contact us at the debated podcast at gmail you can follow us on twitter at debated podcast uh, and like us on facebook again at debated podcast so uh, thank you for listening to the episode and I hope you'll listen to the next one.